Lower Wharf, Neptune's Bounty, March 1953. Chief Sullivan didn't like being out on the Lower Wharf when the lights had been dimmed this much. He could still see to get around, but the shadows around the pylons multiplied and seemed to squirm at the edge of his vision. This wasn't a safe place, even in broad daylight. A couple of guys had disappeared on this wharf over the past week. One of them had been found, or what was left of him. His body carved up pretty good. It seemed to Sullivan, when he'd examined the body, that those nice straight cuts had been made by scalpels. Sullivan's boots creaked on the planks as he walked to the end of the wharf. The cold came off the water, the smell of fish was strong, the reek of decay. Three wooden crates were lined up together on the wharf with a curious palm print logo on them, but he figured breaking into them wasn't likely to provide him proof of the contraband smuggling he knew was going on. They were marked rotten for discard and smelled like it. He figured Fontaine was too smart to have his contraband right here on the wharf. The lower wharf resembled a wooden pier. It slanted down toward water released into the big chamber that enclosed part of the fisheries. The shallow water around the wooden projections was mostly just to give a feeling of a real wharf, to break up the claustrophobia, part of the psychology of Rapture's design. A big electric sign hanging from the ceiling switched off read Fontaine's Fisheries. The walls here were mostly corrugated metal. Above the lower wharf area was the upper wharf with cafes and taverns like Fighting McDonough's, the tavern owned by Bill McDonough, though he had little time to run it in person. The wharf area felt, to Sullivan, like a kind of man-made cavern. Wood and sand and a pool of water below, the looming walls, the ceiling overhead. It was like an undersea cave, only the walls and ceiling were metal. The actual docking area for the fishing submarines, complete with cold storage vaults, was hidden down in the back, in a fish-reeking labyrinth of passages, conveyor belts for seafood processing, and offices. Like the wharf master's office. The wharf master was Peach Wilkins, Fontaine's man. So far, Wilkins had stonewalled Sullivan when it came to the smugglers. Reaching into the pocket of his trench coat to feel the reassuring grip of his revolver, Sullivan descended the switchback ramp to get closer to the water. The briny water lay quiet as a sheet of glass, but something splashed off the shadows close to the wall. He drew the pistol but kept it low, thumb ready to cock the hammer back. He bent down, glanced under the pier, thinking he saw a dark shape moving back there in the dimness. Sullivan squatted a little more, trying to peer into the darkness under the pier, but saw nothing but the glimmer of water. Nothing moved. Whatever he thought he'd seen was gone. But then he saw it, bobbing back there, close to the corrugated metal walls. Someone had been pushing a floating crate along wished he'd had a flashlight. A distinct splashing sound came from back near the crate. He raised the revolver and shouted, Come out of there, you! He was distantly aware of a creaking noise on the ramp behind him, but his attention was fixed on the darkness under the pier, where that splashing had come from. You in there! I'm going to start opening fire if you don't- He broke off, hearing the creaking more distinctly behind him and turned in time to see the silhouette of a man against the dim light of the ceiling, leaping down at him from the higher wharf ramp. A monkey wrench in the stranger's hand poised to bash Sullivan's skull. Sullivan just had time to twist himself to the right so that the monkey wrench came whistling down past his left ear, thumping painfully onto his shoulder. Then the man tackled him. Sullivan was slammed backward, hand convulsively firing the pistol. He heard the man grunt as they both splashed into the shallow seawater. Sullivan twisted as he fell, coming down on his left side. Salty water roared in his ears and choked him. Big rough hands closed around his throat. A great weight bore him downward. He struck out with the gun butt, felt it connect with the back of the man's head. The two of them thrashed, then Sullivan got his feet under him and managed to stand, thigh deep, water streaming off him. 
The other man was getting up, staggering, blood dripping from a head wound. A big square-jawed ham-fisted man in a pea jacket glared at him with one little brown eye through black hair pasted down by water. He'd lost the monkey wrench in the water. The man swung a bunched fist hard at Sullivan. Sullivan jerked back so the blow missed, but he was sent off balance. He tried to fire the gun, but water had gotten in, and it misfired. Sullivan was staggering back to try to stay upright. The man grinned, showing crooked teeth, and sloshed towards him, big hands outstretched. A flash from up on the wharf, a gunshot, and Sullivan's brawny assailant grunted, gritted his teeth, and took one more step, then fell on his face in the water. He thrashed for a couple moments, then went limp, floating face down. Sullivan steadied himself and looked up to see Karloski smiling coldly down at him from the wharf ramp, pocketing a smoking pistol. The air smelled of gun smoke. Nice shot, Sullivan said as blood welled from the hole in the left side of the stranger's head. Assuming that is, you weren't aiming for me. If I shoot at you, Karloski said in his Russian accent, you already die. Sullivan pocketed his own pistol, grabbed the dead man by the collar, and dragged him to the lower ramp, laboring in his water-heavy clothing. Pulling the thug onto the ramp, he bent over, aware of the pain from a deep bruise in his left shoulder, and turned the corpse over. There was just enough light to make out the face. He still didn't recognize him. Or did he? He reached out and wiped the wet hair away from the dead man's face. He'd seen that face in a photo in the Rapture admissions records, a maintenance worker. The guy tried to brain me with a wrench, he said as Ivan Karlowski joined him. I heard you shoot, Karlowski said, but you miss. Didn't have time to aim. You see anybody else on the other side of the wharf? Da, running away. Could not see who. I've seen this one's file. Don't remember his name. Mikhail Lasko, Ukrainian. All sons of bitches, Ukrainians. Lasko, he work maintenance, then do something for Peach Wilkins. I heard in bar, maybe he knows about smuggling. So I follow him this morning. The bastard loose me down in the docking maze. Some hidden passages down there. Seems like this particular Ukrainian son of a bitch was wanting to do me in. Shivering with the chill from the water soaking his clothing, Sullivan went through the dead man's coat pockets and came up with an envelope full of rapture dollars, and in another pocket, a small notebook. He opened the notebook. It contained a list, blurred from the water. He read it aloud. Bibles, seven sold. Cocaine, two G sold. Liquor, six fifths. Letters out. Three at 70 RD each. Looks like he's smuggling, Karlowski said. Sullivan shook his head. Looks like Fontaine or Wilkins don't have much respect for me. Like I'm supposed to believe this guy is behind it all. He's not going to keep a notebook listing cocaine and Bibles. I doubt he knew how to spell them. The envelope with the cash in it was payment to this knucklehead to try to take me down. They were okay with it if he got killed. Make it look like the smuggler was all done for. Take the heat off him. He tossed Karlowski the envelope. You can have that for saving my life. Come on, I'll send someone down to pick up this patsy. They started back up the ramp, hurrying into better lighting. Shit, I hate walking with salt water in my pants. It's rasping my ball sack, goddammit. Let's get a drink. I'll buy you a vodka. Vodka is good to get smell of rotting fish out. And smell of dead Ukrainian. Even worse. A locked laboratory. Rapture. 1953. Absurd, Tenenbaum. Dr. Suchong jeered as he walked ahead of Frank Fontaine and Bridget Tenenbaum. This discovery is very great, Tenenbaum retorted confidently. She seemed to shimmer with subdued excitement. Mr. Fontaine, you will see. Frank Fontaine's deal with Dr. Suchong and Bridget Tenenbaum hadn't quite paid off yet. Maybe, he figured, as he followed her and Suchong into the laboratory, 
Today was the day that particular roll of the dice was going to come up lucky sevens. Tenenbaum's excitement, which she almost never showed, seemed to hint that she'd stumbled across something explosive. Tenenbaum led the way to a sedated man in a hospital gown, lying on a padded gunnery in the most secretive inner chamber of the laboratory complex. She looked the unconscious man over with analytical coolness as she spoke. Germans, all they can talk about is blue eyes and the shape of forehead. All I care about is, why is this one born strong and that one weak? This one smart and that one stupid? All the killing. You'd think the Germans could have been interested in something useful. Today, I think we have found something very much useful. The sleeping man on the gunnery was bound to it with leather restraints. He was quite an ordinary looking man of medium height, brown hair, blotchy skin. Fontaine had seen him playing poker and fighting McDonough's. Willie Broham. On the white metal table beside Broham was an enormous syringe with a thick red liquid in it. Occupying most of a shelf beyond the table was a five-gallon aquarium, tank bubbling with seawater. Immersed in the tank, pulsing repugnantly on a bed of sand, was one of Tenenbaum's slug-like wonders. It was about eight inches long, with a primitive armor fringing on its edges. It had striated grainy skin faintly incandescent blue panels on its humped back, teeth gnashed at one end on its elongated body, a small tapered tail twitched at the other. This Tenenbaum, she think genes answer to everything. Su Chong think genes important, but control of subject's mind, conditioning of synapses, these things are more important. Who controls such controls all. I like that, Fontaine said. Conditioning is something real interesting to me. Read about it in some magazine. The Nazis were experimenting with it. <clears throat> now, this man, Broham, he is wounded. I will show you injury. She lifted up the gown of the man on the gurney, and Fontaine winced to see a nasty, puckered, ragged tear in the man's flesh, about seven inches long haphazardly taped shut just above the groin. He tries to use fishing hook to steal fish from fishery tanks. Ryan's men catch him, slice him with his own hook. Now we have extracted special material from slugs, purified it. This material is made of special stem cells, unstable, highly adaptable. Please observe. She picked up the syringe and jammed it in the flesh just above the man's groin. Broham's back arched, his body reacting, but he didn't wake. Fontaine winced at the sight of the three-inch needle piercing deeply into the man's gut. Now, she said, observe the wound. Fontaine did, and nothing happened. Ha! Dr. Suchong said. Maybe it not work this time, and your great theory. Poof, Tenenbaum. Then the skin around the wound twitched reddened, and the serrated flesh inside the wound seemed to writhe about and seal shut. In a minute, only a faint scar remained of the ragged gash. It had healed before their eyes. I'll be damned, Fontaine said. I call it Adam, said Bridget Tenenbaum, because from Adam in the myth came life for mankind. This too brings life, it destroys damaged cells, replaces them with new ones, transferred by plasmids, unstable genetic material. Now stem cells can be manipulated, their genes changed. We can make them this, make them that. If it can do this, heal instantly. What else can it do? Transform a man, a woman into what? Many things, endless possibility. Su Chong chewed at a thumbnail, staring at the experimental subject, then he pointed. You see there, on his head, some lesions. She shrugged. Hardly visible, a few minor side effects. Some may have much more. Your man with the miracle hands. That one behaves a little strangely now, and there are some curious marks on his arms, like cancer. Uncontrolled cell growth. So that's the key, Fontaine mused. 
these stem cell things and this this atom you can use it to change things up in a man give him special abilities like we discussed precisely she said proudly fontaine could tell she was speaking to him though she never looked at him she would turn her head his way but her eyes were always fixed on some point over his left shoulder as if she were talking to an invisible person behind him growing hair growing a bigger pecker bigger muscles bigger breasts for the ladies bigger brains for the highbrows it is all possible with adam hm su chong said you did not tell him how adam must be constantly re-energized not the concern dr su chong tenenbaum said listening to broham's heart with a stethoscope i have design for energizer we will call it eve she frowned but the sea slugs can only make so much adam and eve these sea slugs we believe they are also parasites we find on sharks other creatures maybe they can be attached to human beings a person could become a factory for adam then we have more adam for experiments she scratched thoughtfully in her unwashed hair working with my mentor all he thought of was how to find greater power in men to breed them to change them working at his side i was thinking of another researcher a greater one haha <laughs> that was the first time fontaine had ever heard her laugh a brittle almost inhuman sound so this adam thing fontaine went on looking at the healed skin on the sedated man if you could get enough sea slugs maybe some people to work with as what would you call them the hosts you could mass produce this stuff she nodded to the imaginary person behind fontaine in time yes but dr suchong shook his head suchong believe adam could be addictive my study of human being showed me anything that make easy change in people the people quickly become addicted a man feel bad take drink of alcohol very quickly feels a little better he become addicted to alcohol same with opium maybe same with adam quick fix in man addictive organism develop need for it su chong observe agitation in this man tenenbaum found on dock sometimes he is what is it you people say he is high addictive even better fontaine thought of the time risk and expense of bringing in poppy from kandahar yeah he could feel it his cultivation of su chong and tenenbaum was paying off keep on this fontaine told them eagerly I'll make it worth your while. Worth all our wiles. Medical Pavilion, 1953. Sitting pensively behind his inner office desk in the Medical Pavilion, Dr. J. S. Steinman was bored and tired of fighting his own impulses, and only just now beginning to understand why he'd come to Rapture. Steinman took a cigarette from a box on the coral desk. lit it with a silver lighter shaped like a human nose and got up to open the curtains on his office porthole so he could gaze out at the sea at kelp and sea fans waving in the current restful that view nothing like new york always hectic in the big apple people interfering with a man it was the implied condemnation he resented the small minded judgment of his greatness How to explain what it was like to reach out for the planet Venus in hopes of making it his pocket watch? How could he explain that he was sometimes visited by the goddess Aphrodite? He had heard the goddess's voice so clearly. "My darling Dr. Steinman," said Aphrodite, "to create like the gods is to be a god. Can only God fashion a face. You have done it." again and again you have taken what was lumpen and made it exquisite you have taken the mediocre and made it marvelous but in every man and woman's face a secret is hidden the lost perfection masked under the face of a woman whom low vulgar people regard as beautiful is another face the perfect the platonic ideal hidden under the surface beauty if you can liberate the perfect face from the almost perfect you become a god what is more important than beauty it was i aphrodite herself who inspired the poet keats truth is beauty beauty is truth. 
Oh, how the goddess had thrilled him. Yes, it was true that he had heard her voice while taking ether, cocaine and ether, by turns, in fact, but it had been no mere hallucination. He was sure of that. So when Ryan had approached him, saying that innovative surgeons would be needed in rapture, he'd heard Aphrodite whispering to him again. Here it is. Here is the chance. Here is the opportunity. Here is the secret realm you've dreamed of, where you can at last unearth perfection. A refuge where the small-minded scorners cannot find you. Steinman blew a plume of blue smoke toward the ceiling vent and turned to look at himself in the office mirror. He knew very well he was a handsome man. The elegant shin, the striking ears, the dark eyes, that understated, perfectly clipped mustache, like an accent mark over a bon mot when he uttered a witticism. And yet there was another face under that one, waiting to come out. Did he dare find his own perfect face? Could he do surgery on his own face, perhaps using a mirror? Could he? Doctor? Miss Pleasance is waking up. He glanced up at the doorway where his assistant waited for him. Miss Chavez, a small, pretty Puerto Rican woman in a white uniform, white shoes, nurse's cap. She didn't seem surprised to find him gazing into the mirror. Chavez was a petite little creature with a heart-shaped face, Cupid's bow lips. Could he find that perfect face underneath Miss Chavez's features? Suppose he were to reduce the pterygoideus muscles by half, then double-tighten the temporalis muscle, and he might just bisect the eyelids. All in good time. Ah, yes. Go ahead and begin unwrapping her face, Miss Chavez. I'll be right there. Miss Sylvia Pleasance was engaged to Ronald Grevy, son of the Reuben Grevy who worked closely with Ryan. They were an influential family in Rapture. He stubbed his cigarette out on the seashell ashtray on his desk and walked down the hall, stretched out in the recovery room. Miss Pleasance was wearing a nightgown and socks. She had a sheet draped modestly over her. Look at those fat little arms. Too bad he couldn't cut those fat little arms and reduce them, perhaps down to the bone. Even expose the bone in places like ivory jewelry. Nurse Chavez had cranked the upper part of the patient's bed to a 45 degree angle and was beginning to unwind the bandages. Miss Pleasance's large green eyes were gazing out at him from the gaps in the mummy-like facial wrap with a mixture of fear and anticipation. Her red hair spilled almost stylishly over one side of the bandages. He thought once more that there might be a certain appeal to leaving the bandages on. Forever. One would see only the hair and the eyes. Mystery. Like a mummy. Sylvia Pleasance's face was slowly revealed. Nurse Chavez gasped and clapped her hands together. Isn't she lovely, doctor? You've done a wonderful job. He sighed resignedly. It was true, all quite lovely. He hadn't done anything experimental with this woman. He was trying not to do anything unusual in his new practice. Just give them what they wanted, but it was hard. The temptation had been strong. She had a conventionally attractive, delicately sculpted face now, with dimples on her pale cheeks, a matching dimple in her chin. It was a sweetly rounded visage, but with all the unpleasant chunkiness gone. Her fiancé would probably be pleased. She looked rather like an adult Shirley Temple. How tiresome. But the Pleasance woman cooed over her reflection when Nurse Chavez gave her the hand mirror. Oh, doctor, it's perfect. God bless you. Yes, yes, he muttered, approaching, taking her chin in his hands, turning her head from side to side, looking at it under the light from the gooseneck lamp. Yes, only I cannot escape the feeling that there is more, far more, to be done. Some hidden perfection lurking underneath this pretty little mask. What? Miss Pleasance seemed startled. She swallowed and drew back from him. I? She frowned and looked at herself again in the hand mirror, turned her head this way and that. No, this is what I wanted, exactly. I'm amazed at how you got it. I wouldn't alter it a jot, doctor. He shrugged. Just as you like. I simply think 
thinking to himself, If I could just cut a quarter inch off the nose, then, perhaps, narrow the forehead, entirely remove the orbicularis oculi. But aloud, he said, I'm so glad you're pleased with the results. Go ahead and get her dressed, nurse. Release her to her fiancé, and I'll, uh... He turned vaguely and walked, as if through a dream, back to his office. Surgical knives are so limited. If only there were some way to transform people on the cellular level. If one could only sculpt people genetically. If only a surgical artist could reach into the very essence of a person, transform the subject from within, just the way a god would. The way Aphrodite would want him to. Fontaine's Fisheries, 1953. It was late. Fontaine's office was closed, the shades drawn. Reggie was somewhere outside, keeping watch. Fontaine and Tenenbaum were alone in the Fisheries office on a comfortable sofa. Bridget Tenenbaum was stretched out, wearing a negligee and red pumps. Fontaine was half sitting on the edge, leaning over her, her hands clasped in his. Beside them on the floor was an empty, whirly wine bottle and their glasses. Fontaine wore only his boxers and a t-shirt. His clothes were folded neatly on a chair at his desk across the room. She seemed frightened, and yet he could see anticipation in her eyes too when she glanced at him, and as always, looked away quickly. You look kinda scared, he said. You sure about this? I do not like to be touched, she said, but I need it. When the feelings of desire come, what I dream of is a man who simply takes me. I will make some token of resistance, but it will not be real. I must fight a little. I can only do it that way. Well, kid, he said, using his voice of reassurance, you came to the right stop. She'd cleaned up rather nicely and put on some perfume, even seemed to have brushed the cigarette stains off her teeth. So this is something you haven't done exactly, but you imagined, he asked. Yes, I am afraid to touch, but I must be touched. What they call a contradiction in terms, that's you, huh? Perhaps. Now, please, put the blindfold on me. Oh, yeah. He took the black blindfold from his pocket and tied it over her eyes. There. You can't see me now. No. Now that I cannot see you, you can touch me. If you hold my arms down. He pressed her arms back by her wrists to either side of her head and stretched out on her, pressing his hips to hers. She tried to twist away, but she wasn't trying very hard. Just remember... Fontaine said as he did his duty, enjoying it more than he'd thought he would. You want it done your way? You do your work my way. You work exclusively for me. Ryan Amusements, 1953 Bill McDonough felt a bit foolish taking the Journey to the Surface ride alone. It was made for Rapture's children, really to satisfy their curiosity about the surface world, supposedly. In a few years, his child would want to go on a ride in Rapture's only amusement park. Bill wanted to know in advance if what he'd heard about the ride was true. If it was, the ride would probably upset Elaine. He'd been here before to do some maintenance work, but he hadn't taken the tour. He'd bought a ticket and everything. Now he climbed into the ride car, shaped like an open bathysphere, and settled back. It lurched into motion, and then creaked along its track into the tunnel. The car rumbled slowly past an animatronic mannequin of Andrew Ryan, sitting at his desk, looking almost fatherly. The mannequin moved and gestured in a herky-jerky way, and talked. Why, hello there. My name is Andrew Ryan, and I built the city of Rapture for children just like you, because the world above's become unfit for us. But here, beneath the ocean, it is natural to wonder if the danger has passed. Crikey, Bill muttered. The Ryan robot gave him the willies. 
Then the car moved on to the mechanical tableau that warned about taxation on the surface world. Up on his left was a farmhouse where a farmer tilled his field and a happy wife and child stood behind him. But then a giant hand, truly gigantic, moved clutchingly into the tableau, reaching down from above. It had suit sleeves on it, like the suit worn by a bureaucrat. It grabbed the roof of the house and tore it off, the tax man taking away all the man had worked for. The animatronic farmer slumped in despair. On the surface, said the deep voice of Andrew Ryan, booming from hidden speakers. The farmer tills the soil, trading the strength of his arm for a land of his own. But the parasites say, no. What is yours is ours. We are the states. We are God. We demand our share. Oh, Lord, Bill said, staring at the hand. It was terrifying, that giant hand. And the hand, as if from some cruel bureaucratic Jehovah, came inexorably down in other tableaus as the ride trundled slowly onward. An animatronic scientist made a glorious discovery in his laboratory, rose up on a pedestal in triumph, and then was crushed back down by that giant hand from above. On the surface, the scientist invests the power of his mind in a single miraculous idea, and naturally begins to rise up above his fellows. But the parasites say, No, discovery must be regulated. It must be controlled and finally surrendered. That one ought to make Su Chong and his like happy, Bill supposed. The next tableau showed an artist painting away in rapturous inspiration before a giant hand came down and suppressed his freedom again. The final tableau was the most frightening of all. A child was happily watching TV with his family. Then Ryan's godlike voice warned. On the surface, your parents sought a private life using their great talents to provide for you. They learned to twist the lies of church and government, believing themselves masters of the system. But the parasites say, No, the child has a duty. He'll go to war and die for the nation. And the giant hand came down, pushed through the wall, and dragged the child away, into darkness, into death. Bill shook his head. This was all about scaring children, it seemed to him. He'd heard that Sophia Lamb, when she'd first come, had given Ryan the idea of an amusement ride that was a kind of aversion therapy, a way of imprinting children with a revulsion for the surface world and a consequent commitment to the only alternative, rapture. Between the big tableaus, animatronic Ryans appeared, lecturing, hectoring, warning the child about the horrors of the surface world. As the ride ended, he heard Cohen's song, Rise, Rapture, Rise, playing. Bill sighed. He was going to do whatever he could to keep Elaine away from here. She wouldn't understand. She already had her doubts about Rapture, and this would only deepen them. Whatever happened, they were committed to Rapture. And Andrew Ryan. Weren't they? Dionysus Park, Rapture, 1954. How can a house divided stand, Simon? Sophia Lamb asked gently as they sat in the sculpture garden of Dionysus Park. Simon Wales sat beside her on the carved coral bench, smoking a pipe, seeming troubled. Margie and several of Sophia's other followers were scattering fish gut fertilizer around the plants at the other end of the park's gallery of sculptures. Across from them was an example of unconscious art a sculpture by one of her followers showing a squirming octopus, but the creature had a human face that was oddly like Andrew Ryan's. Rapture is designed for conflict, for competition. But can this marvel of a community survive that division bottled up here? We need unity to make Rapture thrive. And that means a communal concept, not a competitive one. Simon glanced around nervously. Really, you shouldn't use those kinds of... Well, Ryan would regard that as red propaganda. Could be dangerous. They're building a new detention center, and I have a feeling Ryan might want it for... Ah, 
people who talk about undermining his master vision. Sophia shrugged. If I must go to prison, so be it. The people need me. More are coming every day, Simon. The vision of wholeness is taking hold. Rapture must be a single society, not some schizophrenic social organism forever wrestling with itself. Look at what's been happening. People forced into prostitution, living on top of one another. How is that better than the surface world? If he suspects what you're up to... She chuckled. He's convinced I'm on his team. I advised him on how to set up that little child training amusement park. It's absurd, really. I doubt if it does anything but frighten children, but he believes it'll train them to accept rapture. I gave him an edited report on my... She glanced at him. I can trust you, can't I, Simon? He looked at her with a stunned expression and swallowed hard. But of course, how could you doubt it? You know how I feel. Mummy, look, Eleanor said pipingly. Sophia glanced over to see her small daughter, just three years old, in her pink pinafore, dragging one of the audio diaries behind her. I'm going to play with the Mr. Diary you gave me. Sophia nodded. Wonderful, my love. His voice lowered. Simon asked, Don't you think it's time she had some contact with other children, Doctor? Hmm? No, no. They're under the influence of the poisonous paradigm of Andrew Ryan. I will keep her right here. Train her in safe isolation. Make her a paragon of the society to come. And... <clears throat> what happened to her father? Ah, as to that... It's a private matter. Eleanor was sitting in the grass, talking to the tape recorder as if it were a friend. She clutched a small screwdriver in her hand. Hello, Mr. Diary. Want to play? She mimicked its voice. Actually, I'm quite busy right now, Miss Eleanor. Maybe later. Well, all right. But do you mind if I take you apart while I wait? I promise I'll put you back together. Wait, you can't do that. No, wait, wait, Eleanor. And to Sophia's surprise, Eleanor commenced stabbing at the tape recorder, breaking it apart with the screwdriver. 